I wanted to take a minute today at the beginning of the podcast and say thank you to our sponsor, Huber Engineered Woods. Huber has actually been a sponsor of the podcast since 2020 when we decided to start this little endeavor. Without our sponsors, this content is probably not uh, something that happens. But I think the best part about having Huber as a partner on this is it's an incredibly authentic alignment. Peter, Steve, and I all use Huber Woods. I've been using Advantech Subfloor for coming on probably 21 years now. I've been using Zip System and Zip System uh, with the insulation on the back, the Zip R, since uh, 2013. It's a system that I believe in. It, that systems approach where things play well together. They have uh, design parameters that allow you to use their system for what you're working on. It works. Their tech support's there. Their knowledge is there. I've never had an issue with their product, and it's a great thing that they've decided to buy, to uh, sponsor the podcast. So thank you, Huber Engineered Woods. Good morning, Unbuild It Podcast. Might not be morning where you are, but it is certainly morning where we are. Howdy, y'all. Steve Basic here with... I'm trying to think of how to categorize them <laughs> with these two fine gentlemen, Jake Bruin. Good to be here. And Peter Yost. That scream you gave, I wasn't sure whether you were spelling morning with a U or not. Oh, like morning. Maybe it is good morning. Yeah. You never know. I'm, I like to keep you guessing. Anyways, beyond Peter's. Way with spelling, spelling jokes. Spelling jokes that don't go anywhere. Um, yeah. So let's talk about not going anywhere. So today's a really good topic. I chose it. Um, not that you guys don't choose good topics, but if you're going to blame, I'm, I'm actually saying it so that if you're going to blame somebody, I'll take wholehearted blame for this. But, you know, one of the interesting things <clears throat> when I went to school, probably my biggest takeaway was I have a, one of my most favorite teachers there was, he said, you know, architecture is a pretty simple thing to do once you've identified the problem, hmm. which is probably true of almost anything. And what I find a lot, um, and, and it, you don't have to go very far, social media, um, people I know, go out to a job site, all kinds of stuff. We love to talk about solutions. Like people always want to talk about, oh, just do this, do this, do this, do this. But they really didn't identify the problem. And if you identify the problem and you put that list together, then solving for it is a pretty easy solution. Yeah, but solutions can be sexy and problems rarely are. Yeah, but if your goal is to solve the problem, then you really need to get to the heart of the problem, right? And understanding it. And now I'm going to give you a quick example because what really made me think about this was the project where um, in one of our previous uh, podcasts, we talked about hydrology of the site. And I talked about moving to a superior wall system that didn't have a traditional footing. It actually has a stone pad. Well, when the hydrology of that site suggested to provide some type of movement underneath the foundation system where we could keep water doing its <laughs> natural thing. So once we identified that problem, doing the superior wall system was pretty much a no-brainer because it was a really good solution for that problem. And, you know, beyond that, and in, in, you've been out to the project um, – we're doing this Riverside project, and the homeowner there is one of the smartest people I've ever met. Um, very intelligent, engineering mind, and that's what his his business is in that realm. But his mantra, which you're going to appreciate, Peter, because you're a man of mantras, is man the, of the, mantra. the best decision should win. Right. And and he believes that wholeheartedly. And sometimes that that decision is financially based. Sometimes it's performance based. But the right decision should always win. And that gets back to even our last podcast where we talk about, you know, if I draw something and the homeowner draws something else and says, well, what do you think? And it's like, well, I what I thought was this was the best solution. And um, 
or this is the best product. Like, why do I want to consider a butyl sealant if acoustical sealant I think is the best? Yeah. So it's it's one of those things where and 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 I know a lot of people, um, architects, designers, engineering types, they want to jump right to the solution, but they don't really want to understand what the problem is. And before I leap it or launch it to you guys, I'll I'll what you call it. I, I'll give you another example. Years ago, Peter's familiar with this story because I've, I've uh, been known to say it many a times. I was working with a production home builder. This is through the Building America program, Building Science Corporation. And we're in Sacramento. We're in a large room, like probably 20 plus people up there. And we're trying to figure out how to get a mechanical closet in their plans, bring all the ductwork out of the attic, bring it into the house, et cetera, et cetera. And we weren't looking for a lot. These were three, 4,000 square foot houses. And I was like, we probably need something like a nine to 10 square foot mechanical closet. It's not big. We did that at Artistic Homes. Our standard closet was like three foot five by four foot or something like that, right? <clears throat> 10, 11 feet, square feet, whatever it is. So the the woman architect there said, you know, I, I just don't see it. And I said, well, you know what the problem is, is the problem isn't in finding the solution. The problem is, is not really identifying the problem. And she's like, yeah, well, we don't have space. I said, no, that's not the problem. Right. I, and so I asked her, I said, have you ever done a house where you didn't put the kitchen sink in? And she kind of chuckled and said, no, of course we put a kitchen sink in. And I said, how about a powder room? And she goes, no, we always put a powder room in. I said, well, the problem is, is that you just need to serve the mechanical room with the same priority you do with the powder room and the kitchen sink. And then it would be no problem to solve and provide a solution. You just choose not to. So identifying the I'm really problem. happy that I don't generally challenge Steve in a public forum where there's 20 people in the room waiting for him to make me look bad. <laughs> what I was looking for was how did she take all yeah. this? Um, well, I, and by it, the way, I mean, it could have been a guy car. I mean, some people are sitting there saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't because she was a woman architect. It just happened to be that she was. Um, but the, the one person that it do is the only person I really cared about was our buddy Rich up mm -hmm. there. And because he was the manager at the um what you call it production home builder mm -hmm. that we were trying to satisfy and he called us in to solve his problems and but but there's been other situations that are very similar where you know people want to talk about oh I want to do this I'm going to do that I'm going to do this right and and I'll launch it to you because this has probably happened to us on projects right homeowners draw a really great plan and they think it's a solution and I can look at the floor plan and say, well, how do you put a roof on that? And they're like, oh, well, I never really thought about that. Well, that's because you never really identified the problem. You want to identify the solution. And so yeah, when we get that 60 by 60 square that has all the rooms that they want in it and it's got everything yeah, and look at this flows through and look at how big my walk in closet can be and stuff. And it's well, yeah, but, you know, one, it doesn't fit on the site Two, you know, it's a sloping site that you're going to end up with an 18 foot retaining wall underneath your foundation system on the other side. And but all of these things, because they don't really think about it. So, you know. Being an architect, if you know, if you wanted to take five minutes and see what it feels like, it's really trying to identify what is the problem. And even with my clients, I you guys know I give my clients homework. Well, as soon as they sign up, they say, Hey, we want to work with you, Steve. Okay, boom. I send them the homework email and say, do this. Um, and there's, you know, five different things of their writing a narrative, doing all of this. And Basically, what I'm striving to do there is identify the problem, right? Everybody wants a new house. Everybody wants to build a new house. But some people have different problems than other people. I need more storage. I have eight kids. I have two kids. I have no kids. We like TV in a family room. We don't, we don't even want a TV in the house. So everybody has slightly different problems. And if you're building a custom house... The beauty of that is it should be a custom house. I shouldn't walk away and give the Smiths the same plan I would give the Joneses. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to throw it to you, two very intelligent gentlemen that are joining me. When you get into problem solving and 
how do you do it? And what's your thoughts? I'm going to look at Peter because I'm at a loss here. Well, that was an amazing setup. I mean, it really was. Well, so I wrote two things down. My work is often pretty different than what you guys do. And it is all about problem solving because rather than people coming to me with solutions, they almost always come to me and I'm going to say not with the problems, but with the symptoms. Right. So that's a big problem because they want me to run around like six year olds around a soccer ball, like take a look at this because this is the symptom, but it's not very often that the symptom is clear as to what the problem is. So that's for me, you were making distinction between solutions and problems. For me, it's a difference between symptoms and problems because that's what they want you to go after first. Um, And then the second thing is, you know, uh, my brother Nathan was a pulmonary physician, but he also was a building scientist and was talking with him one day about, um, you know, you were not never really happy being a being a doctor, being a physician. And he, he smiled and he said, yeah, the, the problem wasn't the process. The problem was the people. <laughs> that, I see Nathan saying that. I well, don't like people. <laughs> well, no, it, no, that it wasn't that he liked people. It's just that it was way more stressful to do the process of figuring things out with people because you care about them, you know, in a way that you don't care about buildings to say, but but that's part of what he was uh, trying to drive home. But the reason he was such a great or is such a great building scientist is medicine is all about diagnose diagnostics. So the, the process that you go through, because what do the people come to you with? symptoms. Right. Right. And so the really, really good physicians are really, really good sort of investigators. Yes. And it's, and, it's and, really interesting you bring this up. Yeah. Because diagnosing health issues is a lot like doing building investigations because you're trying to translate symptoms into problems. So I'm doing a project for a gentleman who is a extremely highly rated physician in the United States, Hmm. has his own practice. Um, And we've had many talks because with I have some medical issues. And so we've had some talks, but we've had talks about in general about the medical industry. And he said, there's the good path and the bad path. The Hmm. good path is where doctors, they see the or the bad path is doctors, they get the symptoms. And there's literally the medical checklist. Oh, you're coughing, sneezing, this and that. Okay, that means it's one of these three things. Oh, we'll see you have a sore throat too. So that eliminates that one. So now it's one of these two. But the doctors are never really allowed to think outside Hmm. of that checklist, right? It's kind of like a a building scientist that goes in and says, okay, you know, here's the problem. Well, it's probably one of these four things. It's water. It's probably from the roof or a window. Yeah. And they're never really thinking about it. So when you were talking about, yes, I get the symptoms, but I can't necessarily just trust someone's opinion about those symptoms. Mm-hmm. I have to go yeah. and I have yeah. to identify them myself, get my own. And that's where the good process is for the doctor. Yeah, you get those symptoms. It could be this, but let's not restrict ourselves to just that thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's take it a little further and see if we can identify exactly what the problem is. So the symptoms are a vehicle to get you to the problem, but they're not the only way to get there. Right. And not necessarily the best way. And not necessarily the best way. And I think, you know, when we talk about some of the best building science investigators, like Joe would always, you know, he would walk in the door, talk to the facilities manager and get the symptoms. But you could also see in his mind, he's he's throwing out that symptom. That one really doesn't matter. That one doesn't matter. This one. Now, that's important. And so he would come back over the top of the guy with two or three questions Mm -hmm. so that he could then start to identify the problem. Right. So it's it, again, it's one of those things. And it doesn't matter who you are. It could be the electrician, a plumber, a mechanical guy, an architect, a structural engineer, everybody. You know, problem solving is a, a, a general concept. But I think our our lives have gotten so fast that we're really quick to jump to some solution without really spending the required time to do the problem solving. It does make me think about when I was 
17, 18, I worked at a camp in the middle of uh, you know, rural northern Maryland. And th- this camp had a lot of volunteers that came to help out because it was, it was a nonprofit. And uh, so I was working as the pool director, you know, lifeguard. And uh, pool director, Pete. Pool That's director going on Pete. my regular. Pete, Pete. <laughs> uh, so this guy's probably in his 70s. I'm 18 or 19 years old, somewhere in that range. And we're having a real problem repacking this particular pump, you know, and I knew absolutely nothing about pumps, piping. And this guy was a, you know, mechanical uh, wizard, but he was also a plumber. And so we're working on this thing and it's just, we, we, we can't figure it out. You know, it's just not, and I'm getting more and more frustrated. And he says, um, uh, I'm going to smoke a bowl. And so I'm like, what? And he, he stopped, he sat no down. No problem solve this with pot? No, pipe tobacco. He was, <laughs> okay. you know, an older guy, you know. No, not Smoke a Smoke a bowl does not mean the same thing well, uh, to my okay. generation as it All does right. to yours. Sorry. It's a generational problem. <clears throat> multi, but anyway. Multi-generational. Yeah. <laughs> so he said, he looked at me, he goes, do you see how frustrated you are right now? You know, you're never going to solve this problem beating your head against it. You know, you got to. And he said, I used to be like you when I was younger. And, you, you know, you just keep hammering at it. And as I got older, it's like, I, I need to take a break here and and sit down and think of think it through a little bit. And I it, it made a huge impression upon me because, you know, my dad was a hard charging, just keep at it type of person. This guy was like, no, sometimes you just need to step back and you're not going to solve it by just beating on it. You got to step back. There's a lot of people that want to be first off the line and, oh yeah, I'm going to solve this right away without thinking about it. And it just made me think Farley, (laughs) who's the builder on the vineyard that I do a bunch of work with, you know, he coined the phrase work slower to be better or to be faster. Yeah. Right. And he's, he basically saying, step back, really get a true understanding of what the problem is. And it, and it could be, how am I going to finish this um, handrail on the stairs, mm-hmm. right? How does that finish into the wall? And it's like, take a step back and really let's think about this. And what are, what are the problems? Is it that it comes in too low? It comes in too high? How do, how do we solve for that? And I can so, tell you, just, just from my building investigation work, especially when I first started, I want to solve it. I want to prove to them how good I am and solve it as soon as possible. And I mean, that can get you into real trouble. You almost always need to take a step back and double check everything before you go spouting off about, I understand exactly what's happening. It's, I've done that. It's what you and I or what I said when we had Tim Hell on the podcast recently, my Mark Twain quote that I like so much. It's not the thing that we don't know that gets us in trouble. It's the thing that we know for sure. That we're certain about. Yeah. That gets really true. Well, I always I like the other Mark Twain quote, the one that says, better, better to be silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and prove <laughs> it. <Yeah>. <laughs> that <laughs> is a really good one. You know, but it's it's the same thing. It's yeah. like, yeah, we all want to be first off the off the starting line mm-hmm. and first to the finish line. But getting to the finish line with the proper solution demands that you put in the the right amount of time to understand the problem. Well, we I real quick before we get too far from Peter's comments about I want to get there and I want to show him how good I am. Aren't you hourly? Like, isn't it all billable hours? Don't you want to? We're not here to discuss my <laughs> business model. What you, you're cutting your you get the full picture. Well, he's trying to make it back. Bill to the for home the afternoon. For soup. He's trying to make it back to the home for before soup. the soup bell rings. <laughs> it's like when I mean, Joe would go out he, at the home. Shuts Joe down would go out and he already knows the answer. He says, "If you if you don't do the show, show you, you can't get the dough. dough. Yeah. Or if you want the dough, you got to do the, the show. show. Yeah. yeah. There's so, that too. There is that. There is that. Well, that that rush is what gets us all in trouble at some point or another. Although I had a conversation in the last two weeks with a a builder friend about like my strongest suit when I'm on the job site or when I'm helping with managerial stuff that's towards the job site part of it. I'm really good at decisive action. Mm, mm. And, you know, when I was younger and I was framing every day. I was a good enough framer that I could go as fast as I possibly could fix a few things that I screwed up during the day and still come out ahead than other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
So it's not necessarily that decisive action. My decisive action, and I think one of my strong points, is my ability to look at a problem, process it, and make a decision. Uh, and and like, I have enough breadth of my knowledge to be able to be like, okay, I, this is what we're going to do. And half the time it feels like nobody else in the room has considered what the the solution might be yet. They're still processing the problem. Like, but I'm still getting to the right solution the majority of the right. time. So I guess I'm patting myself on the back. Yeah. How, how about, have you, have you guys ever felt, so being an architect for 30 some odd years, I can honestly say that like there are times where problem solving is like a very simple greased lightning process for me. And then there's times where I'm smashing my head against the wall. Yeah. yeah. And the beauty of being an architect is, is it, I've, a lot of times I tried to fight it as a younger um, lad, but fight what aspect of the, the, the I'm going to get keep, through this. Yeah, I'm going to get pushing. through this. I'm going to, I'm going to figure out this floor plan. And now I simply, okay, if, if I, I can tell when I'm not feeling it, I'll shelf it and then I'll just go and I'll do some footing details and stuff for this other house, like stuff that I don't, yeah. it's, I just have to go through it. Yeah. To me. And then tomorrow morning I'll grab that plan and drop it down and I'll solve it like that. Yeah. And it's like the, the solution just goes, or there's times where like, uh, I'll be sitting there and I'm about ready to go to bed. It's like 11 o'clock at night or something. And I'll be like. Oh, you know, all of a sudden I start thinking about this. I, so I open up the file. Next thing I know, I'm like, damn, that's it. And then I look up and it's like 4.45 a.m. <laughs> and my wife was like, did you even go to bed last night? And I was like, yeah, but I, I was on a roll excited. and I didn't want to lose it. Hmm. And I'm trying, I, I can honestly say, like, I don't know what spurs it, what makes it come on. But there's this level of clarity all of a sudden sometimes that happens that says, just go and it, the you can do it. Word you're looking for is inspiration. Yeah, but it's but it's not even so much. You can be inspired <clears throat> to solve the problem. Yeah, but it's, a, it's sometimes it, I, I get it and I, and I agree. But I always think of inspiration as like giving me the ability to think out of the mm -hmm. box, like the inspiration to the next best idea. But it's not always that. It's just like the ability to clear my mind from a whole bunch of things and only see this like it's sure. almost like a baseball player right ted williams said his success was he could he could slow the pitch down to see the thread the the threads of the ball mm -hmm. and that allowed him to to hit it right so it's it it yes i'm not saying i'm ted williams but i'm slowing down the design is. process to get a level of clarity that isn't always there i and in this like let me shelve it and come back to it Versus when you were younger and you were like, I can figure this out. I hadn't really processed it until you said that. I think that it's been like the last two and a half years, maybe of my career that I've been able to say, yeah, I don't know. Let's talk about that again tomorrow. Yeah. And like been able to not to leave something unsolved for the day, mm -hmm. which is not, I mean, that's the completely opposed to my decisive action is my, is my strong point. You know, in and even my client meetings, like I'll, I'll, I'll like tell the client, Hey, yeah, well, next meeting, we're going to talk about this. And like, if I don't get that clarity, then I will shift gears and I'll do some other things. And we have the meeting and I say, Hey, I need some answers over here and there. And they say, well, I thought we were going to talk about that. Yeah. I don't quite have that figured out, but I will, we will figure it out. It just hasn't come around yet. Not and, yet. and so you know, I'd provide a little redirection there, but years ago, I wouldn't want to do that. I would try and fight through it. And what I would realize is, is yes, I would come up with a solution and I would show it to them. They'd be happy and we'd do it. And then like a, a little time later, I'd look at it and go, yeah, we probably could have improved that if we did this. Hmm. And it's like, and, and I mean, that just comes with experience too, right? Yeah. That you can look at something and say, yeah. But it's sort of having faith in the process because when you're younger and you are just beating it on, you think beating it really hard on that door, you think this is the only way to solve this. And what you learn is, well, not only is it not the only way, it's probably not going to be, be the best. best. Yeah. And that's, and that, that'll take it that when you say that, then I think, okay, social media, when people post something and say, well, this is the only way to waterproof that. 
or this is the only way to install a window. It's like, no, identify what the problems is. Because if I'm doing a window, a series of, say, four or five windows that are under a 10 foot, um, you know, roof opening on a back deck, then those windows probably don't have to have the same water management level of um, closure or, or treatment that the window around the corner that doesn't have, it's in a two-story wall, right? That one we're going to have to be a little bit more concerned about. It's funny you should say that about <clears throat> protecting a wall from uh, from water. I was working on a project up that was at the very top of Lake Champlain. And so it's like a 50-mile fetch of the wind coming across the lake to his house. Wait, explain the word fetch in this yeah. scenario. I don't know this terminology. Oh. Fetch is what's the open space that the wind can come towards you it's from. Like and it doesn't fetch. have to do with water. It's just that's the it's unimpeded path. The unimpeded path. That's a good way of describing it. Okay. So it's to, to, the the every day. to the parsonage. To the parsonage. <laughs> so, but the, Listen, uh, I'm just separating the wheat from the chaff here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So the, the, the thing was, he said, I really need to solve the problem of the of the fact that water's getting inside the house. And I was working with the homeowner because he had gone to a presentation I had done in Boston on how buildings work. And, but he had this place up on the top of uh, Lake Champlain and there was a high performance builder involved. And um, it dawned on me, I'm thinking like, you know, this is going to spend, this guy's going to spend an awful lot of money to beef up his water management system to, you know, separating out the cladding, putting in a rain screen, um, providing that space to drain, but also convective drying. And I was looking at the house thinking, do we have to do that on the entire building? And I thought it only leaks on one side. Yeah. So I turned to the Let's builder, small. I turned to the builder and I said, I think what we can do is completely change the way the south facing and the south south facing was the view, right? right. So it's got the biggest windows. It's got a deck yeah. attached to it. I said, the water management details here are going to be very expensive to correct. And we're going to have to take a lot of things apart, but I think we can ignore the two sides of the building that aren't facing the lake and the leeward side, which is the back. And the guy just looked at me, he goes, I've never been involved in a project where the solution to the leak was tuned to like to the prow of the boat. And we only worked on one side of the house and the corner boards and the client, I talked to him several years later, he says the, the prow doesn't leak anymore. Yeah. It's <laughs> so, funny because it makes me think I, Matt came out, he visited one of my projects and it was, it's, it was the large project that we did on the coast. And I said, Matt, I go, you know, as a, a middle-aged architect, I said, the uh the, the later one, age later age <laughs> i said one of the one of the most um fulfilling moments is you know getting to design an 8000 square foot house on the coast and i said but along with that comes the scariest moment of my life and that's designing an 8000 square <laughs> foot house on the coast yeah, yeah. right like it's <laughs> yeah. different it's serious business it's a different game changer it's a game changer yeah especially when the house that we tore down had water problems <laughs> and it's at the forefront of the husband's mind like he and he said it said steve i don't give a shit what you do with the house make her happy the windows better not leak yeah 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 the fear of the lord in you yeah, yeah. you know so um i don't know how close we are to wrapping up but what i wanted to say is I'm going to need a lot of help with the resource on this one. I have no freaking idea. I'm sure there's books on problem well, solving and I guess so, self-help books. I know that you've done a lot of type of reading. I haven't. So we're going to, I'll, I'll look for. That might be a push. Even <laughs> even better would be a uh, sort of the zen of problem solving for the building industry. Right. Because that's what we're trying to do is combine philosophy. Well, I think it's with, anything. I mean, problem solving is problem solving. Whether we talked about the medical industry and. I'm sure the automotive industry has some of the same problems. But. I think the key words are going to be diagnostics. There you go. Zen. But. Uh, pack a bowl. Yeah. So I do have a little <laughs> funny story to tell you guys. So I'm all ears, man. As you know, Lexi, my daughter, works with me. My son, who was you know home for the summer, is now back at architecture school for his final year, is working for me. 
But every morning we'd come down and we'd say, okay, we're going to start at 8.30. No steals. Lexi's there. She's on time. She's sitting behind her desk. She's doing things. And 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, he comes strolling in. And I'm like, steve what the hell? It's like, you know, we're supposed to be here at 8.30. And um, you're, you're just not here. Like, what, what's going on? And without skipping a beat, he looks at me and he goes, Dad, I just, I guess good heart, good employees are hard to find. <laughs> so. Oh, man, that must have made your blood boil. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyways. Good employees are hard to find. Yeah. Yikes. All right. So. Please take us out. There you have it. Problem solved. <laughs> we talked about problem solving. So, it was a good podcast. I like these that really don't have a specific target. A little philosophical. A little thinking. So, so, when you're driving in your truck to work, now you can go to work and say, hey, I'm going to approach these problems or things. Instead of jumping to the solution, I'm going to maybe think about it for an extra little tidbit of time. Come up with a better solution even. So, anyways. Steve Basic here from the Unbuild It podcast. If you want to write in, tell us your stories, ask questions, you can. Questions at unbuilditpodcast.com. Write them in. We're going to do a few more Q&A sessions, I'm sure, in our near future. So uh, we look forward to uh, sharing those with you. So until next time, three amigos down here in Texas. We'll see you later. Have a good day. So long.